Hello everyone and welcome to the budding watch enthusiast. So today um, we're going to be talking about kind of what watches to look at at a specific price tier as far as like your introduction to that price tier because I myself um, I'm getting ready to make a purchase here soon. Um, tax refund time is this time of year so uh, it's it's a time of year where I take a, get to take a little bit of the money that I get back uh, from from tax returns and and spend a bit of it you know be responsible with most of it which is the smart thing to do but indulge myself um, with some of the money and this year it's going to be a wristwatch purchase so I'm making the first leap for me um, into I guess that kind of mid to you know, I guess it's not the first leap because I did buy the sow Baltimore already um, which is kind of in this class but for me it's the first watch that I'm um, taking a look at that's in that mid range tier and for for me personally I have three tiers um, you know, lower impulse tier and then the higher, uh, like luxury tier, and then this one right in the middle, um, which is what we're talking about today. And we'll, we'll talk about the other two tiers in future episodes that we're doing. Um, but today I just wanted to look at four watches that I've done a ton of research on, uh, the, the four watches that most interest me right now that are in this, in this middle tier. Um, kind of weigh out the pros and cons of each and because I, I think that these four um, watches that we're going to be looking at today are definitely four good candidates to, if you're looking to you know getting past the you know the introductory level Seikos and 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 Orients and things like that that are a good uh, four good watches to check out at this next like this next step up I guess you can say when you're ready to maybe you know put some money aside and save up for a, a much more premium watch than you've pro than you know you start out with so far. Um, these are four really good candidates, I think, uh, just based on the copious amount of research uh, that I've done in them and, and other watches around this price tier. So we're also very very briefly um, later on in the video going to touch on uh, a bit of a controversial topic um, among watch enthusiasts, but we'll we'll get there down the road. So let's let's take a look at it. First one is sort of a watch collector staple. Um, that is the Seiko Sarb 017, uh, better known as the Seiko Alpinist. Uh, this is a uh, this this is like an Explorer style watch that takes you know inspiration from like a Rolex Explorer things of that nature. Doesn't look like it, of course. Um, we're looking at a 38 millimeter case width, which is a great width, probably. 38 millimeters, probably the low end for what I think looks good on my wrist. I have a larger wrist, so anything below this would probably look a little small on me. Um, I like, you know, I have my Timex. It's a 35 millimeter that looks, you know, freaking tiny. It looks like a woman's watch on my wrist. Uh, so 38 is is a fair size. The thing that catches your eye immediately about this watch, unsurprisingly, is the green dial with the gold um, numerals and, and markers on it. Very eye-catching, very attractive, and not a color scheme that I would normally go for. Uh, I'm more of a black, blue, you know, maybe a silver type of guy. Uh, gold I hate. I, I, I can't stand gold jewelry, gold-plated jewelry. Um, I own nothing that is that is gold plated not a thing my wedding ring isn't no watch that i own isn't probably no watch that i ever own will be not even like a rolex date just or anything like that but i i don't uh but for for whatever reason it's very attractive on this watch now obviously the case is in stainless it, it's silver colored it's in stainless steel um but yeah, that, that dial, that, that pattern, that numeral pattern. I also like the fact that the even numbered uh, numbers on the dial are actually numerals and then everything else is an indice. I think it gives the watch a very distinct and iconic look. Um, it, it looks great as an everyday wear watch, um, you know, it, it, but it can also get by as a dress watch. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to do a quick wristwatch check. I'm wearing my Sal Baltimore today. Uh, actually, a very appropriate watch to wear for this video because this also falls into this kind of price range. And would, if I didn't already own it, would probably be something that I would be considering. Um, and if you missed my review on that, you can check out that card right up there. I'll put that right in there for you. Make sure you do check that out. Um, but getting back to the Alpinist. Uh, so again, works well as an everyday watch. Works well as a... You can even get by with it as a dress watch. Like it looks fancy enough 
that it is a dress watch. Um, there's two things that I don't like about it. First is the cathedral hour hand. Not my preferred style of hour hand. Out of all the notable like hour hands that you see out there, it's probably my least favorite. Some people really like it. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, it's it's not the best to me, but whatever. It's it's not not a deal breaker by any means. The other thing that I that gives me pause with this one is the fact that it is super popular. I've always had these like hipster tendencies where the more popular something is, the less appealing it is to me. And it's completely unreasonable and stupid, um, but that's just kind of the way it is. So because it's such a staple, because it is so popular, uh, it's it kind of, it doesn't knock it down, but it makes me less excited to want to run out and grab it. Like, like the Alpinist, I feel like will always be there. I don't need to rush out. It, you know, it's something that I can get whenever I get the chance to. It's not, I'm not rushing to grab it on my wrist. That's the Alpinist. Um, the next one. So I, I'd always kind of looked at Hamilton. Watch. I've been looking at Hamilton watches and Hamilton is a cool brand um, with some great history and heritage. Uh, they started off as, a, as an American watchmaker. Uh, they used to provide watches to the U.S. military, which is very neat. And then in the, I think it was the late 70s, uh, they moved their operations to Switzerland. And now they are a Swiss, Swiss watchmaker, um, but they still love to advertise that American heritage that they have, which is very cool. I've, I've always been partial to their field watches. They have a lot of different field watches out there. Uh, the field um, date automatic is probably, or mechanical is probably one of the most popular field watches you'll find. There's also the Khaki King, which is extremely popular, but it doesn't really do anything for me. I don't like the way that the day date complication on this, on the Khaki King is situated at the top of the watch that cuts off some of the numbers. It's not very aesthetically pleasing to me. But the other day I came across in looking at some Hamilton watches, this one here, this is the Hamilton Field Day Date Automatic, uh, specifically reference number H70505833. This is a newer style field automatic watch that they've put out and this watch is gorgeous. I love the way that the watch is designed. Um, you have the separate day date complication, which I think work with the full day complication, by the way, at 12 o'clock, which I think works way better than it does with the Khaki King. Having them separated from one another, I think it makes the watch look a little bit more aesthetic, makes it look a little bit more symmetrical, much more appealing to my eye. Of course, I love the clean dial, uh, the, the very legible design of, of the field watch, which as a field watch, it has to be legible. Um, the thing about this reference number specifically that really got me right away, I love the patinaed style color that they have on the numerals, on the dial, on the hands. Oh my God, it, it looks so much more eye-catching than just your standard black dial with white, you know, white numerals and white lettering and stuff like that. It's, it is great. Like I said, I saw this and like, as soon as I saw it, I was like, that's the one. That's, that's the Hamilton Field watch that I need to own. The, the only two, um, minor grievances that I have with this one. Actually, there's actually three minor grievances. This is a 42 millimeter watch, which looks fine on me, but for a field watch, I almost kind of wish that it was a little bit smaller. And you'll see why in a second, because there's another Hamilton watch in this list that I'm gonna talk about. I almost wish that it was a 40 or 38, because I think that would have suited the watch a little bit more. I mean, like I said, when I eventually get my hands on this one in person, maybe, maybe that's all for nothing, but it feels like 42 for this watch size might be big. It probably has to be that big because of the day date complication. Um, that's what it is though. The loom pattern on this one is a little disappointing. Aside from the hands, you just have these pips on the outside that are loomed. The num the numerals themselves are not loomed. I kind of wish they were. And the third thing that is kind of a sticking point in this one, part of the thing that the mechanical Hamilton Field Watch has that I think is better is a bead blasted case. Uh, this one is brushed steel combined with a, with a polished steel bezel. Not unattractive by any means, but that I really like that bead blasting. And for a watch that's supposed to be more of a rugged watch and more of a more of a um, you know a tool watch of sorts, uh, I think that the bead blasting would look even better. But man, oh man, this watch is just something to behold. Something really nice to look at. Uh, the other Hamilton watch on my list, 
is the Hamilton Pilots Day Date Auto, um, reference number H64615135. Uh, movie buffs, you may have seen this watch before because this was the watch that Matthew McConaughey's character wore in Interstellar. Uh, and that's where it's very popular, especially in the watch community. Uh, another really attractive Hamilton watch. Um, this one is also 42 millimeters, but this one I think should be. This is a pilot's watch. It's supposed to have a little bit of a larger dial so that it can be you know, read a little bit more legibly. So I, I totally understand it for this watch and I think it makes much more sense. The, the thing that catches my eye the most on this watch specifically is the hands. Um, the hands on this one are fantastically designed, very cool looking. Um, the two things I like the most, of course, the, the pointer on the hour hand is cut out, but it's cut out in such a way that when it passes over the hour markings on the inner part of the dial, you can see the number through the hand. That's very cool. And then when these two hands, when the minute hand and hour hand do line up with one another, the way they, they were designed, it almost looks like it's one watch hand that goes all the way across with that loom, especially when it's loomed up. Woof, it's, it's, it's a really cool looking design. Um, also love the minute markers prominently featured um, on the outer part of the dial. They're, they are the highlighted portion, the larger numbers. Uh, it has the same day-date complication that the that the field auto that we just talked about has, which I really like. This one though, um, it, it's not quite jumping out at me the same way that the field watch did. And the other problem with this one too, the price is climbing steadily because they Hamilton released a new version of this watch uh, with a abbreviated day-date complication at, at a more traditional three o'clock position. They don't have the separate ones here. And because this watch is getting harder and harder to find, the price is incrementally increasing on it. Uh, possibly to a point where I'm not sure how excited I would be to pay uh, to get this watch. So the last watch on my list is a dive watch. And it is from a, a brand that I would have never heard of unless I, except for learning more about this hobby and getting into the collecting aspect. And that is Squale. And the watch that I'm looking at from them is the Squale 1545 Diver, specifically the Heritage model. Um, this one caught my eye immediately, of course, because of the root beer bezel. I just think that the root beer bezel on this is just, just fantastic looker. Um, eye catching immediately, really stands out prominently. Now there's two versions of this one too. There's one that just has the root beer bezel with a black dial. Um, and then there's one that has the root beer bezel and a root beer, a brown dial as well, a root beer dial as well. And I'm having a lot of trouble deciding which one I like the most. I really like the contrast between, you know, the, the bezel and the dial with the black dial version, but that root beer dial has like a sunburst effect on it. Really looks good. Really, really looks good from images and from video that I've seen. It's a stunning, stunning watch. Um, it also has the Cyclops date, um, which I don't know yet how much I would like or dislike. I could take or leave it right now. I've never had a watch with a Cyclops magnifier on the uh, on the crystal to look at the date. I'd have to see when I get it. This is a 40 millimeter watch. It's a great size. There, there's two things about this one that are sort of a sticking point. The first one is one that doesn't matter to me that much, but it might matter to some folks. Um, the second one is more to me. So this watch is an homage watch. Um, and for those that don't know an homage watch, what that is, it is a watch that borrows very heavily from the design aspects of another watch. Um, in this case, the Rolex Submariner. It's a very obvious homage to the Rolex Submariner. I've learned in finding out more about this, this hobby that there are some people out there that really don't like homage watches, that really hate them, that really think they're awful, and, and they're like the worst thing and companies should not do it and you should not buy them. And they're somehow bad for, you know, the company who makes the original watch. Um, I am not a subscriber to that theory. I mean, look, uh, there, there's a reason that homages exist is because there are some watch designs out there that are so iconic and so fantastic that you can't help but, you know, check it out, right? Like you can't help but use some of those design principles in the watches that you make as well. Now, homage has taken a step further and they are very, very deliberately designing, you know, the watch, 
you know, especially with the dial in most cases, to look like this other watch. And again, with the Squale 1545, it's undeniable that that the Submariner was a huge, what was was kind of the basis for the design. Um, but this this watch also would never prevent me from buying a Submariner. Like like first of all, I'm not buying a Rolex Submariner anytime soon unless I fall into like a large sum of money. And even then it'd have to be a huge sum of money because I would want to use that money for other more responsible things first before being like, okay, now I'll go spend nine grand on a Rolex Submariner. Like, that, like that's not something that's happening anytime soon. And even if I do come into that money or even if I do save up for years and have enough money to buy my own Rolex Submariner, it's not like I'm gonna be like, well, I've got the Squally 1545, so I don't really need the Rolex Submariner because this is inadequate. No, absolutely not. The, the, the Squally is not gonna be a replacement for anybody for a Rolex Submariner ever. Never, ever, ever. Um, the reason that I pause on this watch is because I don't wanna load up a collection with dive watches. Some people really like uh, a certain style of watch and they'll collect a lot of watches in that style and I really do like dive watches and there's several dive watches that I do want to own but I did just get a Seiko SKX a couple months ago um, and I don't know if I want to go to another dive watch right away like this th like the Squale is a watch that I'm pretty sure I'm going to definitely own at some point it's just a matter of when do I do it so there we are those are the those are the four watches that I think um, are four terrific prospects to getting into this tier. And then again, I, I've not I've not gotten a chance yet to handle any of these watches, um, to see them in everyday use. This is again just based on the tremendous amount of research that I've done. So I would love to hear from you guys down in the comments below. Um, what are some pieces uh, in this price range, this $500-ish price range, that you think are great choices for budding watch enthusiasts uh, to check out as maybe their first entry into this price tier? Um, definitely would love to hear your thoughts. Um, I have to figure out <laughs> which, which one I'm gonna be looking at, so we'll, uh, I'll have to think long and hard about it and see which one um, is the most appealing to me. But that is it for this video. Um, thank you very much for watching. If you could, if you if you enjoy this content, please leave me a like um, and share this out to someone who you think also might be interested in it. Also, while you are here, click the subscribe button uh, right down there in the right-hand corner so that that way uh, your feed will be populated with all of the budding watch enthusiast uh, videos that we'll be putting out here, or that I'll be putting out here in the future, rather. Um, again, thank you all very much for watching. I will see you guys next time.